Listen, today I'm going to do a message that uh, we simply entitled Killing Envy and Jealousy. We're going to talk about what it means to be thankful and how we begin to uh, start being thankful if we're not. Why thankfulness is so important and, and the things that kill it, which would be envy and jealousy. And as we come into this Thanksgiving week, hopefully we will take, all take a moment uh, to be thankful to God for friends, family, or for whatever we have to be thankful for and express it to God. Some of you might sit here and say, I have nothing to be thankful for. That's not true. It's just how you see things. And you know, I, I thought this when we were worshiping God, I thought, you know, I didn't have this thought in the two other times I've preached this already. But sometimes people say, well, if I had this or I get this, then I'll be thankful. Can I tell you something? Once you get it, you will still be unthankful. Um, so that's a deceptive lie. Well, if I had this, if God would just do this, I'd be thankful. That's not true. It doesn't work that way. You just become, you just, it's because unthankfulness is never satisfied. And so we, through this message, we're going to uh, maybe discover the things that are so deceptive where we need to rethink our thoughts. And hopefully when we leave here today, we'll all purpose to begin to practice being thankful. So many people struggle with being thankful. They don't feel blessed. They don't feel like they have uh, been taken care of properly. They don't feel like they've had the same opportunities as others around them. But folks, it is impossible to be thankful when you're full of jealousy and envy, or you're envious. And so we're going to kind of use those terms in the same way, even though I, I believe they're a little different. When you go through the scriptures a lot of times, they're, they're used uh, synonymously with each other. And so today we're going to deal with envy and jealousy. Envy to me is when you want someone to lose something so you can have it. In other words, you want something someone has, but you want them to lose it to gain it. Jealousy is you want what someone else has, and then you're afraid that someone will take something that you have. So that's why couples or people that are jealous people, they're always comparing themselves with, do you think, you think they're prettier than me? Do you think they're better looking than me? Do you think they're you know, more handsome than me? They, they, they deal with all these things. But envy and jealousy are horrible, horrific uh, characteristics, if you would, things to have in you. They, they, they create every kind of evil thing that can happen derives from those two characteristics. And they're not from God. God doesn't want us to ever be envious of anybody else or jealous. Envy is something that even the Ten Commandments speaks of because it is covetousness. And the Bible says it's an order, it's a command. Thou shalt not covet. So folks, that's why we got to be careful in our world. Listen to the media. Listen to all the things that sound so good that aren't good at all. When you talk about socialism, socialism is, is, first of all, it's failed in every country it's been tried. It's, 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 it's ungodliness. It's, it's wrong. It's covetousness. And, and the other thing it does, it begins to re remove or eradicate Christianity. Because if you believe in socialism, you understand there's a dictator that dictates to make sure everybody falls in line. And so freedom of religion is thrown out the door. And then when they talk about the redistribution of wealth, it's like, well, they have so much, why shouldn't they share it? And my question is, why should they share it? It's theirs. And when you buy into socialism, it takes the incentive away from human beings to achieve and grow, because I'm going to work my tail off to give something to somebody that's not going to work at all. I mean, I'm just trying to explain it from a biblical standpoint. God is not a socialist. He's a theocracy. And, and, he, and, he, and, and you can't find where that's taught. I give of my good desire when I want to give. But to be forced to take what I've worked hard for and give it to somebody else is not a godly principle. Well, pastor, they have too much. That's not for you to say. And the only reason we say that is because of envy and jealousy. Because somehow I deserve more than I have. And I'm thinking if you want more than you have, then work harder. Go get trained, go to school, go do something or, or learn a craft or, or whatever it is. But God wants us all to achieve. But envy and jealousy will cause us to think wrong. 
and buy into things that sound so good, but they're so horrific. And so when we talk about envy and jealousy, we're also talking about covetousness. Both envy and jealousy make you feel inadequate. And again, we tend to use jealousy and envy as the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. I'm going to read some of these scriptures today, not all of them, from the passage translation. Maybe, you, maybe a lot of you haven't heard from it or about it, but I received one, and I, I, I like it. So I want to read 1 Corinthians 3, 3 from that translation. For you are living your lives dominated by the mindset of the flesh. Ask yourselves, is there jealousy among you? Do you compare yourselves with others? Again, it's what I was talking about earlier. Do you quarrel like children and end up taking sides? Isn't it funny how people take sides? They take sides without hearing both sides. Well, they're my friend, who cares? You, you know, we gotta learn either we please God or please men. And someone can be my great friend and tell me a story, but I've gotta take it the same way I take any story, well, let me go hear the other side before I take sides. Yeah, I knew that would go over well, but anyway. <laughs> and end up taking sides. If so, this proves that you are living your lives centered on yourselves, dominated by the mindset of the flesh. And I like this, and behaving like unbelievers. We shouldn't be jealous. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves with others. We shouldn't be quarreling, quarreling like little children. You know, in the church world today, it's so funny when you look at it, people that get turned off at church, it's because when you come to church, they fight over dumb stuff like the painting on the walls or the color of the carpet. Who cares who's going to heaven or hell? Let's just fight over that. I put my foot down. I don't like the carpet. I use, unless you're paying for it all. I just, but, but that's... Most of the arguments in church aren't over the serious matters. And so Paul is admonishing us. He's saying, are you like this? Paul called them infants, babies in their Christian life because they quarreled like children. They compare themselves, they're easily distracted and they were jealous of each other. See, our goal should be to allow God's desires to become our desires. That should be our goal. And jealousy and envy is a sign you lack self-control. That's all it is. We, we lack self-control. But here's the good news. God wants to help us. Envy and jealousy are triggered when you believe you've come up short or you believe someone wants what you have. That's why couples, you know, I hear them. I used to talk to them all the time. I still do it. And you'll t one, one of the, in the, the relationship will be jealous. And the husband or wife will say, I can't do anything. If I look left and there happens to be a young lady, or I look left and there happens to be a young man or a man, the other one would say, do you think she's prettier than me? You think she's better looking? You think he's more handsome? Do you want him? Do you desire? And it's like, all I did was look over there. I didn't even know they were over there. So they, they almost had to walk with blinders like the horses. So they can't look anywhere. And so people get under bondage and they feel trapped. And then when people get out of that trap or out of that cage, they never want to go back. Then you'll hear, well, I'll change now. Why didn't you change before? Why didn't you get under more self-control before? Why are you so insecure that you think every guy your wife wants more than you? What are you doing wrong? Or wife, why is it you think your husband wants every other woman but you? What are you doing that makes him think that? You know, it's funny the God, how God talks and I wasn't going to do this, so this is free. <laughs> I've not said it any other time. Isn't it funny when you look at the Bible, not funny, but ironic, you look at the Bible, the Bible tells the men to love the wives and the wives to respect the husbands. You know why? Because men want respect and women want to be loved. Amen. You can tell the man you love them all you want, but if they feel disrespected, they're going to go somewhere else. Well, they disrespect me, I know, because we, we all have to fight each other instead of one stepping up, doing the right thing, and hopefully believing the other one will see it. That, that was free. 1 Samuel 18, I'm not doing marriage counseling, but someone probably need to hear that. 
1 Samuel 18, verses 5 through 9. Listen to this. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. Now David was one of the baddest dudes in the Bible. He was one of the toughest. He had his mighty men of valor. I believe he was the toughest of all of them. He was a bad dude. He could, he could cut you, kill you. I mean, he, he could fight. But yet, let me tell you about David, why God loved David. He was never too prideful, as tough as he was, to humble himself before an almighty God and worship him. I mean, he, he danced so much, he danced his clothes off. That's the real dance off right there, man. Just... When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. And this was their song. I love this song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Yeah, that made Saul feel good. This made Saul very angry. Can I tell you something? When you're full of envy and jealousy, you'll be angry all the time. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next they'll be making him their king. I mean, he was prophesying because God had already anointed him as king. So from that time on, listen to this, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. He was already jealous of David, but let me tell you something, jealous and envy you, is hidden until it's not, and when it's not, it's very ugly. People harbor it, and you don't even know it. Saul hid his envy and jealousy of David until he couldn't any longer. You allow envy and jealousy in your heart and eventually it will lead to hatred. How many of you have had people that you've done better in life? You've gone to school or what? you've got a different job, you moved out of a neighborhood that you grew up in or whatever and you thought you had friends and sooner or later those friends say to you, you think you're better than me today. Come on, anybody? Yeah, isn't it funny? Or you think you're something because you have more and you thought they were your friends and then you see this jealousy and envy, it's spewing out of them. That's all it is. You think you're some. It's when you become a Christian. How many of you heard this? You think you're better than me now. You think you're more righteous. You think you're like close to God. Come on, anybody? See, that's jealousy and envy spewing out of them. And that's why we have to recognize what it is. When those people say that, you would thought, and, and here's what's funny. They will say, you think you're better than me now because you, you have more and you can go do this and I can't and you just flaunt it and you're like, I have never thought those thoughts. Come on. But you're caught off guard because envy and jealousy is hiding until it can't hide any longer. And when it comes out, it's so ugly. I mean, jealousy and envy is why people kill each other and murder and steal. There was a lady at a bank I worked for, you know, I was a gopher, but she was very well liked and loved and then they found out she was embezzling money and the thought was, well, we didn't have what everybody else had. So they thought they could just take the money and go get what everybody else had. That's what jealousy and envy does for you. It does nothing good. It's horrific, it's awful. We gotta start realizing how bad it is. It'll make you full of anger, it'll make you hate. And those that are the recipients of it are caught off guard because I've never thought I was better than anybody. And then you get around people that you thought loved you and you love, and then that stuff starts spewing out of them. You just think you're better than me now. You got this and you drive that and you, wear, you live in that house and you can buy all this stuff. You know I can't do that. I don't even know why you come around me and you're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea what was hiding in your heart. It won't hide forever. James 3, 14 through 16 from the New Living, New Living Translation. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness, some people, some translations use competitiveness, are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly and unspiritual and demonic. Listen to what he's saying. These things are from the pits of hell. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Now, when you look at this word selfish ambition, some translations do it, competitiveness or being competitive. And I've had people tell me, as a Christian, you should not be competitive. And I don't buy into that. 
I think there's a destructive competitiveness. I think there's a destructive competitiveness where you want people to really do bad. So here's the thing with me. I don't want you to do bad. I just want to do better. That's my thought. I don't, I don't care. I mean, you do good. I just want to do better than you. And like my wife is very competitive. You play games with her, she wants to win. And then, man, I mean, I play games where I've actually thrown a card and, and once it hits the pile, it's a played card. I'm like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, no, you played the card. I'm like, what do you mean? I, but you know I didn't mean to. I don't care what you meant to do. Card laid is a card played. I'm like, but you knew, and I don't care what I knew. And I think there's a healthy competitive. You know what? Because really as Christians, as believers, we're competing with the pits of hell for the souls of men and women. We got to be a little competitive to say, man, I'm going to get my message to them before the enemy deceives them and takes them to hell. We, we, we're, we're competing against an enemy that doesn't play fair, that wants everybody to lose. So I think there's a destructive competitiveness that's unhealthy, but I think there's a healthy competitiveness that, that keeps us alive and moving. And so we can't have bitter jealousy living in us and just be selfish in our ambition. Seeking God's wisdom delivers us from the need to compare ourselves as well to others, to want what they have. So are you comparing yourself to someone else? Do you compare your life to someone else's life? That is what the world wants you to do. The devil, worldly thinking wants you to do. Folks, I don't compare myself with anybody. I know people that have so much more than me, and I, I'm, I'm happy for them, I don't care. My life is my life. And when you're walking in jealousy and envy, you'll never be thankful for what you have. And so I thank God for what I have. And I thank God for what someone else has. It doesn't bother me. I don't want theirs. I, I'm willing to earn my own way. Are you listening? So when you look at somebody else and say, look what they have, how come I don't have that? Well, maybe you should go ask them how they got it. And then when you talk to these people, you realize they sacrificed, they worked their tails off, they went to school, they, they did whatever it took to, 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 to gain a craft and be good at their craft. It took a lot of work and discipline. I get around some of these people that have, and they work all the time. They're, they're constantly working at their craft or whatever it is. And when you look at somebody that says, I want what they have, then that says that God doesn't have anything for you. It's unhealthy. It means you're not thankful what God has for you. Why are we looking at anybody else and comparing ourselves to anybody? Why would we ever do that? But jealousy does it all the time. Jealousy is a thing that will destroy you. Envy and jealousy want to trap you. Listen to Galatians 1.10, the Apostle Paul. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I wouldn't be Christ's servant. Being a people pleaser will wear you out. Now, I'm not saying I shouldn't try to please my wife or my wife please me or we want to bless our kids or please, you know, bless friends or whatever. But people pleasers suppress his or her own needs in order to please or satisfy the needs of others. And when you're like this, you can feel excessive guilt and anxiety when you can't or don't please somebody or do what they need you to do. You fear the disapproval of others. And that's when it becomes unhealthy. That's when you gotta be careful that we wanna please God over anybody else. We, we have to put God first and not people. Sometimes you gotta say no to people. Sometimes you can't do everything they want. And here's the thing, if you're a people pleaser, what you find out is you can never please them anyway. Because the more you do, the more you're supposed to do to keep them happy. Some of you are trying to please your grown up kids all the time. I hear it all the time. And my thought is why, they're grown-ups. They're supposed to be grown-ups. But why do we try to please them all the time? Well, I just want them to like me. Are you kidding? Because the more you do what you find out is the more you have to do. It's never enough. Because you know what? Jealousy and envy is never satisfied. It's never satisfied. So whose approval are you seeking? Others or God's? Proverbs 23, 17, 18 reads this way. Don't envy sinners. Listen to me. We're talking about comparing ourselves and jealousy and envy. Don't envy sinners. It's not a suggestion. But always continue to fear the Lord. That's a reverential fear, respect and honor. You'll be rewarded for this. 
your hope will not be disappointed. So we're not to envy sinners. Listen to this, Proverbs or Psalms 37, 1 through 5. This is from the Passion Translation also. Don't follow after the wicked ones or be jealous of their wealth. Don't think for a moment they're better off than you. They and their short-lived success will soon shrivel up and quickly fade away like grass clippings in the hot sun. Keep trusting in the Lord and do what is right in his eyes. Fix your heart on the promises of God and you will be secure, feasting on his faithfulness. Make God the utmost delight and pleasure of your life and he will provide for you what you desire the most. Give God the right to direct your life as you trust him along the way, you'll find he pulled it off perfectly. In other words, I hear people say, Pastor, I'm doing everything God wants me to do, and these people aren't even godly, and look what they have. And God is saying, how dare you compare yourself to the wicked? These people don't serve God, they don't love God, they hate God, they mock God, and look what they have. He says, are you serious? You're gonna compare yourself to the wicked? Stop doing it, who cares what they have? Well, pastor, don't you think people are going to have too much? Absolutely not. That is not my call. That is not my concern. I don't even think about it. In fact, I grieve over America. I grieve over the church because we buy into the worst kinds of envy and jealousy. Well, don't you think they should share it with me? Absolutely not. Not unless it's their desire. But to be forced to share what they've worked for, whether they got it good or bad, that's not my call, that's not your call. What I care about is, God, I just wanna please you. I'm gonna delight myself in you. I'm gonna to learn to be thankful for what I have. And then I can quit worrying about what other people have. Envy and jealousy are the antithesis of thankfulness. When you are full of envy and jealousy, you are never satisfied with what you have. Nothing will ever be enough. How thankful we are reveals the health of our souls. Listen to Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there's people that think, well, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're gonna act like a drunk person. That's not what he's saying. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And listen this, and give thanks. Everybody say give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're gonna give thanks to God for what? For everything in my life. Not for everything that happens, but for my life, that God, I thank you that even when it's bad, you'll help me when it's good. Amen. And we have to learn to find things to be thankful for. If you have nothing else in your life to be thankful for, here's what you can be thankful for. If you've asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, you can thank God for the forgiveness of sins and that when you die, you can spend eternity in heaven. But he said, give thanks. Now, I don't give thanks to God that my hair is waved goodbye. A lot of it, I still, I'm thankful I have some. But I, I'm not real, real happy about it. So I don't say, thank you, God. In fact, I tell God, God, you said the hairs on my head are numbered. So I think God looked at me and said, boy, I'm tired of counting the hairs on your head. I'm gonna thin it out so I can count them a lot easier. I don't know. But I'm not thankful for that, but I'm thankful I'm still healthy. I'm thankful my mind is working. I'm thankful I, I can function and go and do what I want to do. Are you listening to me? You have to begin to practice to be thankful. <laughs> Colossians chapter three, verses 15 and 16. Verse 15, I'm gonna read out the Amplified Classic Version. And then verse 16, I'm gonna read out the New Living. I just like verse 15 out of the Amplified. And let the peace, soul harmony which comes from Christ, rule, act as umpire continually in your hearts. Deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in that peaceful state. In other words, it's the word of God that is the, is the umpire of our life. To which, as members of Christ's one body, you are also called to live and be thankful. Appreciative, giving praise to God always. What are we called to be? Thankful. Let, not, let the message about Christ and all its richness, richness Fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. If you really want to know how healthy 
you are, check your level of thankfulness and gratitude. The word gratitude means the quality of being thankful, readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness. If you really want to know, if you really want to know how healthy you are, just ask us, how, how, how thankful am I? Folks, I, I thank God for everything. I leave my house. The other day I left it again. And as I pulled in front of my house, I stopped and I said, God, thank you for my home. Thank you for, your, for a wife that loves me all the time and likes me some of the time. <laughs> thank you for my children and my grandchildren. I may not have everything I've ever desired. You know, it'd be nice to have my own private jet. Go where you want, not get strip searched when you go to the TSA. I mean, I, I hate it. I, I think America is so reactionary, and that, that's another message. But, and I think, you know what, wouldn't it be nice just to show up five minutes before you leave and jump on the plane and go? Have your own stuff on the plane, whatever that stuff is. Not be with, you know, 100, 200 people, whatever it is. It would be nice, but you know what, I don't envy anybody that has one. I'm like, great, I'm glad you have one. I don't, I'm not unthankful that I don't have one. I mean, it's just a thought. But man, I am thankful for my life. I'm not, I'm not less off because I don't have that. That may be an extreme example, but think about it. But that's how people think. Well, I wish I had that big of a house. Well, go work. Go to work. Maybe you'll never get it. But can you be thankful for the house you have? I mean, people say, if, oh, I, I wish I just, I, I've got a house that's 1,000 square feet. I wish I had a house that was 10,000 square feet. Can I tell you something? If you can't take care of 1,000 square feet, how are you going to take care of 10,000 square feet? I mean, because here's what I know, because I've been to some houses are just filthy. They're just not, they're just, they're just dirty. And I think, but you want something more from God. You can't take care of a little thing. How, what, what would a 10,000 square foot house look like? I mean, we, we always think wrong instead of just being, God, I thank you that I have a place to live. And here's what we don't get in America. We'll never get it. But if you have a place to live, if you have a car, if you have clean water, running water, you're some of the richest people in the world. Are you listening to me? But you won't ever see, we don't see it that way. That's why the Bible says it's hard for a rich person to go to heaven than a camel to walk through the eye of a needle. Because it seems like the more we get, the less we want to do it. But, but here's the thing. If we can't be thankful for what I have, you know, my wife and I, we rented for a long time when we first got married. And I can tell you this without any reservation. We always left those places better than when we got them. Well, why would you fix them up? Because God told me if I take care of someone else's, he'd give me mine. And I'm a witness. Aren't you supposed to be a witness? Aren't you supposed to be an example? So when they, they knew we were Christians, so they can leave. They said they left it clean. They left it, they left it in better shape. We painted it. We fixed it up. In one house, we planted a yard. We planted gardens where there was just nothing but dirt. I mean... We, we have to be responsible. Who are you trying to please? But when you're unthankful, you'll think, it's not mine. Why should I care? Because God tells you to care. And when you're thankful, you're just appreciative. I have a place to lay my head at night and feel so, somewhat safe or secure. See, we can be thankful if you want to be thankful. Listen to this as I close. Gratitude or thankfulness is what we experience when we perceive that what we have received is an undeserved gift of God's grace. The complete opposite of envy. It is a fruit of humility. It's inherently unselfish. We don't feel true gratitude towards ourselves, but only towards someone else who treats us better than we deserve. That's how Joseph felt being entrusted to Potiphar's chief steward. In other words, folks, I'm thankful to God because I didn't deserve anything from him. I didn't deserve forgiveness. I didn't deserve anything. He said, Steve, I'm just going to give it to you. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. The more thankfulness is present in us, the less vulnerable we are to sin. I want everybody to hear that one more time. The more thankfulness is present in us, the less vulnerable we are to sin. That's why the Bible talks so much about thanksgiving. Thankful people have set their eyes on God, recognizing to some degree how much grace we are receiving right now, trusting him to cover all our sin and work our painful past for good, and looking to him for all we need tomorrow and into eternity. Souls that learn to be content in God, in whatever situation you might find yourself in, are souls that are the least vulnerable to temptation, particularly covetous temptations. 
Therefore, cultivating thankfulness should be one of our core strategies in helping each other fight sin. We should encourage each other to be thankful. Colossians 3.15 that I read earlier. Not out of guilty obligation, but out of an unashamed desire to be happy. Thankful people are not only the most spiritually healthy and spiritually protected, but very often they're the most happiest. Cultivating thankfulness is not easy. We all need help. And thank God, help is available. But there is no thankfulness hack, no four easy steps to a grateful heart. It's as hard as habit building. We begin to train our heart, eyes, to look for God's grace in all circumstances. This looking must become habitual. And habits are built by doing them every day. We get incrementally better at them as the days gradually accumulate to months and the months to years. They become more and more a part of us over time. But it is worth the effort. Thankfulness is one of the most powerful affections God has given us. The capacity to experience. It is far stronger than lust or any bondage of sinful pride. The more it grows in you, the more spiritual health you will experience and the less power sin will wield over you. So in other words, folks, we need to cultivate a thankful spirit. It'll cause you to be healthier. It'll cause you to be able to fight sin. It's when we get so discouraged that we're more likely to sin and fall into temptation. When we get mad or angry. But if you and I will practice thankfulness, make it a habit. In fact, when you leave here today, you should say, thank you, God, for giving me a life. Thank you, God, for what I have. What I have may not be much, but I thank you for what I do have. See, you begin to practice being thankful. Well, pastor, I'm not very thankful. See, that's the spirit of envy and jealousy. And you'll be so unhappy. You'll be an unhappy camper. If you want to be happier in life, cultivate thankfulness. It's a powerful emotion. It's powerful. And over many years, I practiced. I'm just thankful for what I have. I stand here all the time. My wife and I have been together a lot of times and we'll say how thankful we are for what God's done with us, how he's used us. I'm just thankful. I may not have everything I've ever desired, but you know what? If I don't, I'm still thankful. I'm grateful to God. Life hasn't always been easy, but I'm thankful God has never left me. He's always there for me. I'm thankful that when people that call themselves friends at times, they leave you, that God will never leave me. I'm thankful that in me is eternal life, that I didn't earn or deserve, but God just loved me enough to send his son to die for me. That if I receive him into my life, I would have eternal life living in me. I'm thankful that God forgives me every time I blow it. I'm thankful that I have the ability to think, and to make choices. I have the ability to listen to God or the devil. I have the ability to listen to the word or the world. I'm thankful God's given me a mind that can discern right and wrong and, and see through things. I'm thankful for a church that has some of the best people in the world to serve with. I'm thankful that the community I live in has the possibility of getting better and better. I'm thankful that God hears my prayers and answers them. You notice I haven't said a lot of things about things because most people it's about your things. I am not thankful for my cell phone. I remember when I didn't have a cell phone, I was free. Now I'm a cell phone addict. What I'm saying to you folks, if you want to, you can be spiritually healthier if you would just learn to be thankful. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for helping us. I thank you, God, that we'd have ears to hear what you're saying and we would begin to correct ourselves and we would say to ourselves, you know what? I'm going to start practicing being thankful. Holy Spirit, put a muzzle over our mouths and our thinking. When we start thinking wrong and then we start speaking wrong, please deal with us that we'd stop 
And we say, nope, I'm not going to talk about being unthankful. I'm just thankful, God. I may not have had all the time with people, but I'm thankful for the time I did have. God, we can be thankful not for all things, but in all things. Help us. Help us, God. It's such a powerful emotion. It can change all of our lives if we allow it to. Help us to be God pleasers and not people pleasers. Help us to do what's right in your sight, not in the sight of others. Jealousy and envy, we bind you, we rebuke you from our lives in this place today. You have to leave. And Father, for people that are hearing this message, wherever they're at, if they're Rio Rancho, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Brian. If they're East Mountain, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. If it's at East Campus, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. But help us all to be thankful, to practice it, to grow in it. We'd all be happier people. And anger would leave and hatred would leave. Deception leaves. Lies leave. Help us to be more under self-control, to control our thinking and our mouth and our words. Help us, God. And we're thankful that you're always there to help us and to forgive us when we blow it and give us strength. With every head bowed, and you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I've walked with God, but I've walked away. And you're right. The word of God is right. I just quit being thankful. I got so discouraged. Things didn't happen the way I thought or whatever. But I'm ready to come home, and this is your moment. Everything I've talked about has led to this moment right here for you. With all the Christians, with every head bowed, you praying, believing God to touch lives and give them courage just to do whatever it takes to get right. If you're in here today and you're said, Pastor, I really need to give God permission in my life. I, I don't know if I died, if I'd go to heaven or hell. But I do know I'm angry inside, and I do feel slighted. And now you're teaching, and you, the Word of God said that that's not the way I should feel. And I, I don't know how else to feel any other way. And you won't until you ask Jesus to be Lord in your life, and He begins to help you and recognize those things so you can get rid of them. But you've got to come to Christ willingly. You've got to give him permission to your life. And you have to say, God, I willingly accept you as Lord and Savior with the attitude or the purpose that you're going to get to know him. You're going to learn his ways, not just to go back out and live the way you've lived, but to say, I want to change my life. And God wants to change your life. If that's you in Jesus' name, you're in one of those two spiritual conditions, and you say, Pastor, would you include me in your prayer? I'm going to ask you to do two things. Neither one of them are difficult. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is this. If that's you and you say, Pastor, would you include me in your prayer? I need to give my life to the Lord. I need to begin to be thankful. I need to repent. Or, Pastor, I'm ready to give God permission in my life. If that's you in Jesus' holy name, right at your seat, would you please just lift your hand all over this place? Is there anybody here? Thank you. God bless you. As I look across the church, God bless you. God bless you. Who else? As I look across the church, as I look on the upper side, up, up top, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Now I'm going to ask you to do thank you. I see those hands. God bless you. I'm going to ask you to do something for me real quick. And if one will do it, all will. Just so I can see exactly what I'm praying for. Because I know I saw some hands, but I know there were more. If that's you and you mean business, you say, Pastor, would you include me in your prayer? I'm going to ask you right at your seat to stand. I'm not going to call you for it. I just want you to stand at your seat. And then I'm going to pray for you right there. Would you just stand? If one will, others will. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. God loves people. Just remain standing. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you, sir. Who else? I saw a bunch of hands. Thank you. Thank you, young lady. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. Thank you. God is for everybody. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. People standing everywhere. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't, just remain standing. Thank you so much. Because this is, I'm just asking you to do, and here's why. The Bible says if we are willing to confess, our, 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 confess Jesus before man, that he'll confess us before our Father. And he is going, to, he's confessing you right now. All heaven is like rejoicing over you right now. Thank you. This couple up there, thank you, thank you, thank you, young lady, thank you, thank you. Who else? Thank you, ma'am. God loves people, thank you, ma'am. God really cares. You'll never know how much you get, thank you. It's not hard. It'll change your life forever. It'll free you in a way you don't even realize that you'll leave this place and say, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to purpose to serve him. 
and to get to know them. Father, in Jesus' name, you see all those people standing. And God, I, I know you're so happy for them and proud of them. And Father, so we come to you and we humble our hearts and minds. And I'm asking that you bless them with your mercy and grace, that you'll let them know that, man, you can make their past turn out for, for their good. You can change their lives if they're willing to change their lives, if they're willing to follow the word and, and learn to be thankful and quit being ungrateful and, and blaming and because that's what jealousy and envy, it just blames everybody for my life instead of just saying it is what it is today I am going to be thankful today I'm going to receive something I don't deserve and I can't earn today I'm going to receive the mercy of God God bless each one in Jesus name if you're standing I want you to pray this prayer loud with me I want everybody in this place that's been praying, I want you to stop now and pray with us in support of those standing. If you're standing, pray with all your heart. Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in the Bible. And I believe your word declares. If I believe in my heart, the Lord Jesus. And if I confess with my mouth the Lordship of Jesus in my life, I will be saved. So right now I believe in my heart. And now I willingly confess with my mouth. Jesus, be Lord of my life. I give you permission to come live inside me. And now I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for saving me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. This is a gift from you. And I receive it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I am thankful in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church, really good. When the enemy comes knocking on your door, if you're simply part of the crowd, I mean, you're, you're in unsafe territory. But if you're part of the church, you can say, oh, no, 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 I'm a part of this kingdom. I actively pursue you, and this thing that's attacking me will not prevail against me.